So I'm going to start a series of studies looking at some of the some of the, the teachings that I consider to be false, significant false teachings, significant false doctrines. I know that um, in doing this, I probably am going to offend some people. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But um, the point is, what else is new? You know, whatever you do, you're going to offend somebody. But I really believe that there is a foundational reason why people get into difficulties as far as understanding the Bible is concerned. Now, I'm not trying to say that I understand everything. You know, if I, if I said this, you would all be rightly outraged. And, you know, I hope uh, you, you should lose confidence in what I'm saying if I made such a silly claim. I'm not saying that I, I know everything, and I'm not saying that everything that I teach is perfect. No. But I, I think I can say with honesty when I search myself, I think I can say that I believe that I, I have I have come to understand certain foundational principles in terms of studying the Bible and approaching the Bible, which have helped me to be able to stay away from anything that is, is, is false, that is harmful. Okay, whatever whatever I may believe that is not true, whatever false idea I, I may have, I don't believe it's a major false doctrine. There are some things that we need a little more understanding about, yes, but major false doctrines. I think there is a certain safeguard that I have I have learned, which I think will protect me from any major false teaching. And I wanted to touch on that this afternoon as well. Because my, my, the, to the topic of my study this afternoon is the source of false doctrines, the source of false doctrines. So I want to do that this afternoon. And then in subsequent weeks, I want to look at individual doctrines, which I believe are harmful. And I'd like to explain in what way they are harmful, why they are harmful. So... I hope in this way to be able to help those who listen to have a kind of road map to understand what they should be careful of. And also for those who may believe, may actually believe some of these teachings, they may come to see why these things are not compatible with the gospel. So, let me go to my Bible as always. And, um, I'm going to I'm going to identify first of all a couple of a couple of issues maybe I should should um maybe I should print these let me see yeah I probably can put them on a on a blank screen here I can bring up a blank screen and um let me type out some of these teachings that I consider to be fundamentally wrong. All right, let me um, copy and paste, and then I'll just highlight them before we go to look at them in some kind of detail. All right. Um, so I'll put them here. All right, good. Now I have the wrong thing. What happened here? Hold on, let me go back to where I was. <laughs> I did not copy what I wanted to copy. Sorry, guys. All right, yes, this is what I was trying to do. So I have here about five, a list of about five things that I want to highlight. And maybe, you know, somebody might say, this is kind of arbitrary. This is your own personal list. Well, maybe it is, but still, there's a reason why I think these things are 
significant. So the first thing I want to highlight is, number one, a legalistic view of Scripture. The more I have come to understand legalism, the more I, I have come to the conclusion that it is one of the greatest obstructions in the way of understanding the Bible. And I know <laughs> I know that there, there can be a lot of controversy about this. Sometimes what one person con uh, considers to be legalistic, another person insists that it's not legalistic. But there is a basic fundamental principle behind legalism. Most people think that when you talk about legalism, you're, you're only talking about the law. Somebody's, the way somebody relates to the law, they think it means simply that you believe you are saved by keeping the law. That's what they understand to be legalism. But there's legalism everywhere in life. You know, um, I, I saw a little video on whatsapp maybe it was a joke i don't know there was the rain was pouring and there was a man outside watering his garden with a watering can it looked realistic maybe maybe he was just pulling a prank or whatever but when when i saw it i i wrote underneath legalism because this is the the, the this is kind of the essence of legalism you read something or the rule says something or you are instructed to do something and you, 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 you go ahead blindly without thinking about what you are doing or without understanding what you are doing or why you are doing it. This is the foundation of legalism. And, and there is a legalistic view of Scripture where people read the Bible and they don't consider the context, the time, the reason, the purpose, the goal. They don't, they don't think about the ideas surrounding why this statement was made. They just grab the statement and they accept the statement and they say, the Bible says. And this has been a source of a great deal of confusion. And it's not just in little matters like, you know, questions like whether a woman should eat, should cover their heads. Not just little matters like whether or not you should, you should cook food on the Sabbath. It also affects major doctrines, major ideas. People read the Bible in this literalistic way. And they go ahead and they form conclusions and they present teachings when if you examine what is said more carefully, you find that there is a, a reason behind what is being said. And we'll look at some of that in a little bit. The second point I want to highlight is, well, it's not really a second point. It's, it's basically the same thing, but... Um, It's a, it's a further expansion on, on point number one. It's seeking to obtain instructions rather than to understand purposes. And um, we, we understand what this means, right? You, you, the, Paul described this as the way of a servant. As a matter of fact, Jesus did too. Jesus said, the servant does not know what his master is doing. Then if the servant doesn't know, how, how is he going to obey the servant, what Jesus meant is that the servant obeys, but he does not understand why he obeys. That's, that's the, 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 the essence of legalism. And legalism is the duty of a servant. a servant. A servant ought to be a legalist because it's not the place of the servant to question his master. Why do you do this? Why are you not doing this? It's the place of a servant to simply obey. And so, and so it's good when a servant is a legalist because he do, the, the master doesn't need to explain anything to him. He just says, go and water the garden. And the servant says, master, it's raining. That's not the place of a servant. The servant goes and waters the garden even if it is raining. So Jesus says, this is the way of a servant. It's not the way of a son. And that is why a legalist is a servant and not a son. I will, I will say this. Those Christians who serve in a legalistic way, they know God as master, they know Jesus as Lord, but they don't know God and Jesus as friend and as, 
and as father. They worship as strangers, hoping to be saved by their conformity to, to certain things, but they don't understand what God is doing. The, 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 the next point I want to, to, to focus on as in legalism is what I refer to as a proof text approach. All right? Now, most of us might understand what the proof text approach is, and it, you can see why it fits in as well, because the proof text approach is an approach that says, if I can find a Bible verse that says so, that is my proof. All right? So, <laughs> you can find a Bible verse where Jesus says, Well, you can find a Bible verse which says, where, where, which says that God hates sinners. Let's say, for example. And so you conclude that God hates sinners because there's a verse that says so. You find a verse that says, if a man and a woman are divorced, you think it says that none of them can ever get married again. Or some people say the guilty party can never get married again. A lot of people don't take the time to really examine the context and the, 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 the statement carefully to see exactly what is being said. But they find a verse and they can find another verse to match it. And you think that because you have, you can find a verse and you say, the Bible says, you think that you have found the truth. This is another, another way in which people are legalistic in the way they approach the Bible. Another, I never knew that I would ever say something like this but it's reality I have I have labeled this as a verbal inspiration fallacy now I never knew I would ever say this because I, for many years I believed that the Bible was verbally inspired and what I mean by this I believe that every word was inspired by God it sounds good to say so because it it, it, it inspires you to have a great deal of respect for the Bible I, I was of the opinion that every single word in the Bible has been inspired by God. But the more you read the Bible, and the more I developed in my understanding of the Bible, the more I came to see that this cannot be true. And I'll just explain it to you. We're not talking about every sentence. We say every word. That's what verbal means. What, the idea is that God inspired the words that people wrote. If this is true, how can you have a statement made by Jesus in Matthew, you go to Luke and you see the same statement, same circumstances, but the words are slightly different. How do you understand this? Which of these two words did Jesus speak? You see, it, it's, not, it's not verbal inspiration, it's not word inspiration. It's that each person who wrote is saying the same thing or something similar, but it's based on what each one remembers. It's based on how each one understands the story. So, so the story is true. And what is said about it is true. But the exact words. For example, you know, Jesus might have said, you are a set of thieves. Or he might have said, you are a set of criminals. Or he might have said, you are a set of bandits. Which of those words did he really say? Did he say thieves? Did he say criminals? Did he say bandits? I mean, I know those words are not in the Bible, but I'm giving you an example. I, I might remember that Jesus spoke of people as being dishonest. And I might put the word thieves or I might put the word bandits. Because that's, I remember the, the, the thought of what he said. I remember the meaning of what he said. But I don't remember the exact word because you need, you need a, a photographic memory. You need, you need a, 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 a tape recorder Yes, Wayne. Can you hear me still? All right. But when I'm frozen, can you hear the audio? Hello? All right. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Wayne called to tell me I was frozen. Um, I really... I'm just going to continue speaking, and if I get if I'm frozen, I think maybe the recording will still go through because, you know, the phone data 
I'm not sure how it will hold up. So I just can't help that. But I'm going to go ahead and, and just go ahead anyway and um, hope that, you know, everything will work out well at the end and the recording will be good. So, as I was saying about this verbal inspiration fallacy, I don't believe it anymore. The Bible is inspired, but I believe it's the thoughts that are inspired. I believe God brought things back to people's memory. I mean, there are some places where God was actually dictating to people, like, like in the book of Revelation, for example, when John was told to write. And even then, I believe there are some places where John actually is writing what he sees and he's using his own words. There's evidence of this happening in Revelation. You know, but there are some places where, where he actually quotes what, what somebody is saying. So there, there are some places where you have verbal inspiration. But for the most part, what we have in the Bible is thought inspiration. Now, when people insist that the Bible is verbally inspired, and I know some of the translators of the Bible, like the translators of the New King James Version, at the beginning of the Bible, they say they believe in verbal inspiration. The, translator, the translators of the Old King James Version also believed in verbal inspiration. Like I said, I did too. But when you look at the Bible and you start to understand and study it, it's clear that it cannot be verbally inspired. Otherwise, two different authors would say the exact same thing because God would not give each one a different set of words to say about the same thing regarding the same situation. So anyway, that's... That's another reason why people come up with false doctrines. They, they, they hold to this idea of verbal inspiration. And the last thing I want to point out is that the key, the greatest key to understanding the Bible, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, is to know the character of God. This is what I believe is the greatest tool if anybody is to ask me, why do I believe that I have obtained, you know, some kind of consistency in how I understand the Bible? Why do I think that the things that I believe are for the most part true? Why do I, why do I believe that in the important doctrines of the Bible, I am correct? It's point number five, this point here. Let me change the text color so... You know how important it is. Point number five. Everything else that I said is secondary to point number five. God's character is the key. When you come to understand that God is love and you come to believe that God is love and you come to understand that God is reasonable in everything that he's doing, God is reasonable. God is, God is not just good, but God is intelligent. God is smart. God is wise. And God does not do things mindlessly when you understand this then you come to the bible with a different different attitude it's not just the bible says so it's how does what the bible say fit in with the god that i understand and that i know all right so i wanted to 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 record these as what i believe to be the the great principles are, are, are at least some of the fundamental reasons why people end up having fo learning false doctrines. And I'm going to give you a couple of verses just to highlight what I've already said. In Matthew 12 verses 1 to 7, here's an example of where people, they, they, they had instructions, but they did not have understanding. This is one of the things that God gave me. A thought that God put in my head a few, few days ago. You know, the thought is, you can, you can give people instructions, but you can't give people understanding. You know, the Bible says, with all you're getting, get understanding. You can give people information. I can read the Bible for you. I can, I can learn the Bible back and forth. I can do like many Muslims do. And I can learn the New Testament. I mean, the, the Muslims... Many of them know the Quran back and forth. They can, they can recite it from beginning to end. I've known people who can do this with the New Testament. Uh, J. N. Andrews, one of the early Seventh-day Adventist pioneers, he could, he, he could recite the entire New Testament. That does not mean you understand 
what you can recite. The Jews were the same, were similar. They, they could memorize large portions of the scripture. They had them printed and written out, sometimes sewn into their garments. It didn't make them understand any better. And it, an example of this is here, where Jesus went through the cornfield and his disciples were unhungered and began to pluck ears of corn and to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. And I know that, you know, <laughs> to be honest, in my earlier days, I considered it a sin to pick a fruit on the Sabbath day. All right? I mean, you, you, it, it, the, these are rules that are in the Bible. The, the, the Pharisees knew these rules. But the point is, why these rules? What did God give? Why did God give these rules? Did God have something about you eating something fresh on the Sabbath? Did God have something against you reaching up your hand and pu pulling a fruit on the Sabbath? Is there something inherently wrong that will obstruct God's will for you on the Sabbath if you, if you pick a fruit? You know, this is, this is, you hear the instructions, but you don't understand the purposes of the one who is giving the instruction. And that's what the, the, the Pharisees did. They, 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 they found fault with the disciples and Jesus, Jesus ended up by saying something. He says in verse 7, but if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. Here is the thing. Based on what was written in the law, these disciples were wrong. Because the rule said so. The rule said so. As a matter of fact, let me see if I can find the exact place where the rule was given. Let me see. Um, well, the only link I'm getting here is I think there was a verse that said you were not supposed to pick your crops on the Sabbath. I, but the only verse I'm getting here is um, is this one in the Ten Commandments if you look in the right panel. Alright, in the same panel. It says, The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and thou shalt not do any work. So I suppose technically the problem is that you can define picking fruit as working. That's the problem. So the, the Pharisees said that the disciples were working, but Jesus says, There's a reason why you think like this. And it is that you don't understand the principles of the Bible. He says, if you had known what this means, he's telling them that they don't understand something. There's something, they think they know the Bible, but there's something that the Bible says. There's something in the scripture that they don't understand. And what is there in the scripture? The scripture says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. This is what God says. Now, how does this apply to picking corn on the Sabbath. I will have mercy. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that an act of mercy, something that, that, that is for the benefit of a person. Somebody is hungry and he wants some food to eat. But you can't pick fruit on the Sabbath. You can't work on the Sabbath because somebody is hungry. But the rule says, don't work. So, sacrifice or the rule overrides the principle behind the rule. The, 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 the overriding element that determines how you behave is understanding God's merciful nature. That is the overriding element that makes you decide how to behave. But instead of mercy, they saw the rule because they were servants, because they were legalists. Legalists see the rule and they don't see the principle. I feel very strongly about this, very strongly. And I feel more strongly every day when I see how people pervert it. This, 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 this legalism. How they use it to pervert the truth. And how they use it to distort the character of God. They, 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 they quote the Bible. 
but they don't understand the principles of the Bible because they are legalists. They, they see the words, but they don't understand the principle. In Matthew 19, verses 7 and 8, again, the Pharisees, you know, they were the, 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 the essence, they were the, the epitome of legalism. So they come to Jesus and they, 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 they try to trap him with a question about divorce. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? You see, for them, the rule says, Divorce your wife if you find a fault with her. And maybe I can find this one more easily. This one, they should give me the right... Um, Yeah, all right. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. It says, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. My goodness. Cold and merciless. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Now that is, is so hard on the poor woman. Must have been pretty hard on the woman, but it is in the Bible. This is, this is a Bible verse that you can find. And these Pharisees came to Jesus with this scripture because this is the principle they live by you marry a wife and she find no favor in your eyes you give her a bill of divorcement and put it in her hand and send her out of your house wow now it's interesting that the son of god says look at what jesus says he said unto them moses because of the hardness of your hearts allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Now, this is most interesting, and I wish everybody who is leaning in the direction of legalism would read this statement and understand it. Jesus says that God said something. God said something. God put it in his word. It is written in the scriptures. God himself gave the instruction and Jesus explains that this instruction was not the will of God. It was not the heart of God. It was not the mind of God. It was not what God wanted. And yet God said to do it. Something comes out which is that there are things in the Bible that God did not want to say and God did not want to do. But there was a reason why he did it. But he didn't want to do it. That is an important thing to remember because many people think that because he's God Almighty and he, he has all power, he can do anything he wants. That's not what we find in the Bible. There are things God does that he doesn't want to do. And Jesus says, he says Moses did it, but it wasn't Moses, it was God. God told Moses. And he said it was done because, because of the hardness of your hearts. Something about the people that God was dealing with. Something about the way their hearts were hard. They were, they were tough in their brains. They didn't understand God. They didn't understand the ways of God. God had to deal with them a certain way. I know we have talked about this in the past. And we probably will look at this more closely in the future. But that's a, an important principle to remember. When you are dealing with people of a certain category, sometimes you have to come down to their level. And that's what God was doing. But Jesus says, from the beginning it was not so. In other words, what he's saying is that when you are trying to understand the Bible, you have to look at original principles. You have to look at God's plan from the beginning. You have to look at God's character. You have to look at God's nature. You have to understand God's mind or God's character. Let me put it that way. In order to understand the things that happen. Because sometimes the words of God are contrary to the character of God. I know somebody will... will, will will want to stone me for that statement. But it is the truth. Sometimes the words of God are contrary to the nature of God. I can give you examples. When, when, when they found a man picking up... Well, this is one example. 
where God told them they could put away their, their wives and it was not what God wanted according to Jesus. There are many examples of this. The woman that was taken in adultery. They came and they said, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Did Moses say so? God said so. They found a man picking up sticks on the Sabbath day and they asked God what should we do and God says, stone him with stones until he's dead. This was the word of God. Was it the heart of God? Now it's a hard thing to understand why God would say something that was not in keeping with what he wanted to do. Sometimes he even did things that was not in keeping with what was in his heart. Every person that God ever, ever had to put to death any time, whether in the Old or the New Testament, God didn't want to do it. God loved each person. But sometimes there are things that have, have to be done. And that is why we need to look beyond the, the, the surface, beyond the exterior, and understand the heart of God. The, the, the essence of legalism, as I said, is to see the outside. You hear the word of God, but you don't understand what the word is saying. Now, I'm trying to lay the foundation for the, the sessions we will have in the future when we begin to look at some of these false doctrines a little bit more closely in subsequent weeks. And that is why I would like you to understand this principle that I'm trying to emphasize this week. I know we understand it, but I hope we will really think about it carefully because I think we can demonstrate that every false doctrine is based on this fundamental principle of hearing the word of God, but not understanding the character of God. Every false doctrine, not understanding the principle of legalism. Legalism by nature sees what is on the outside. Here is the, the, the audible words. Understands or, or hears the instructions, but in every case, does not understand. You know, it's kind of like God, God expressed the principle when he said to Samuel, when Samuel said, no, God said to Samuel, don't look at the outward appearance. When all the sons of Jesse came before Samuel for a king to be chosen, it's First Samuel 16 and verse 7, and all the, the sons, the, 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 the big brother of David came and Samuel had a kind of legalistic view here because he says, surely the Lord's anointed is before him because he saw the man's height, he saw the man's muscles. He was a strapping big fellow. And so Samuel, you could say, was taking a legalistic view. He was looking at the surface. But God gave him the principle of, of, of the spiritual point of view. The Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance. But the Lord looketh on the heart. Alright, some more examples of this proof text method. It's interesting that um, even Satan knows the proof text method. So when a person shows you that he knows scripture, he hasn't said anything yet. When a person can quote scripture, he, he gives you scripture to back up what he's saying. He has not said anything yet. Scripture without understanding, scripture without properly understanding can be used to mislead people. And Satan tried it even with Jesus. He quoted the scripture. He said, if you, be, if you are the son of God, cast yourself down. For it is written, he quoted a text. He gave a proof text for what he was saying. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in thy hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. He came proof texting. And it is still a method of his followers today. Generally those who are legalistic, they can give you a verse. And they bind you, like Jesus says, you know, you know, where does he say it? Let me see if I find it quickly. Jesus said of the Pharisees, Matthew 23 and verse 4, look what he said. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and they lay them on men and lay them on men's shoulders. 
but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. You know, that, that's the way of legalism. You, 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 you put burdens on people. You read something or you, you insist that there's something that they ought to do. Some legalistic thing that you put on people and you, you, you give people a burden, a rule that they must obey, something that they must perform and they go ahead and they obey because you are somebody in authority and because they don't know God for themselves. Another example of this misuse of scripture, proof texting, is where the disciples, James and John, wanted to command fire to come down from heaven and to consume those who would not accept Jesus. These brothers were quoting the scripture. They were, they were using the Bible as precedence. Elijah called down fire from heaven. And so they wanted to, to emulate Elijah because here was a greater blasphemy than what happened to Elijah. All that they, they did, they came to Elijah, God's representative, and they demanded that he come down off the mountain. And Elijah called down fire and devoured, killed 100 of them, 50 each time. Now this is the Son of God and they are doing something similar. They are rejecting Christ and they say, Lord, you want us to call down fire on them. They know the word of God, but they don't understand the heart of God. And that is always the problem. Um, so, as I said, the greatest tool for getting rid of this burden of legalism is to come to understand the kind of person that God is and then to make this the great element by which we interpret the Bible, the great tool that we use to interpret the Bible. In John 16, verse 2 and 3, Jesus says, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Okay, so Jesus says, referring to you and me, and to all his disciples, that the time is coming when people are going to kill you, and they think that in doing this, they are carrying out the will of God. But Jesus says, And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. The reason why people do things like this, the, pe the reason why people kill other people, the, pe the reason why people, people exercise religious intolerance and they kick you out of their services and they don't, they don't, they don't allow, you, allow you to come into their company. I mean, I understand. Sometimes there are people who like to make trouble, okay? They go and they create disturbance and they, 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 they make a riot. Okay, I understand. But something interesting happened to me just this week where, you know, I got a message from a brother who says that he posted a video, he posted a link to a video, one of my videos, in, in, a, in a chat group that he belonged to. And the next thing he knew, he was removed from the group. He was kind of a little amazed. And so the person who was the administrator, he, he asked him, what happened? What did I do? Was this an accident? And then the person just says, Dear brother, it is forbidden. No, it, not that it was forbidden. I don't think it was a rule. Otherwise, he would have known it. He said, the, 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 if, you, if you quote David Clinton or mention his name, this is an, a reason for you to be automatically removed from the group. Now, that's an interesting thing. But at the same time, you would think at least the brother would have been able to, should have been able to at least get a chance to correct his mistake and say, well, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Let me take down the video. But the, 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 the idea is that the moment a person has been, uh, has been infected with the idea that there can possibly be any truth coming from this person, David Clayton, the moment a person's mind is in that, in, in that, in that area, instantly, that person has become unacceptable and that person is dismissed. This is not the spirit of God. It's a spirit of legalism. You make a rule 
and and it's it's the same kind of principle you make a rule you don't understand the 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 god the nature of the god that you are dealing with okay you become conscience you become uh, the guardians of the the conscience of people you with your limited thinking and your poor human perverse nature you become a guardian over people's conscience to determine what they can listen to what they can believe what they can't believe and if you if they don't follow your little rule then instantly you dismiss them it's the same principle they don't have the permission or the authority to kill people today otherwise they would it's interesting that people like Martin Luther people like John Calvin John Calvin burned had Michael Servetus burned at the stake had him burned alive John Calvin that many people understand to be one of the, the, the outstanding reformers. Calvin burned Michael Servetus alive because he didn't believe in the Trinity. Because Servetus did not believe in the Trinity. Calvin had him burned alive. Luther recommended stabbing, chopping, slicing the Anabaptists, exterminating them. Martin Luther recommended this because they did not hold to what Luther believed. So the, the, the point is, you know, these men came to some kind of understanding of the grace of God. They came to some kind of understanding of, of righteousness by faith. But they did not come to know the God whose grace was on display in saving us. They knew something, a little bit of his character. Let us say they were, they were ahead of the Roman Catholic Church. But you come out of Catholicism and you go back to practicing the same way of murdering people who don't believe in you. Yes, it was a dark time. It was a dark age. Yes, there were some degrees ahead of Roman Catholicism. But then again, you see, they were, they were focused on doctrine. And they said, doctrinally, we are right. We can prove our doctrine from the Bible. But they didn't know the character of the God who had saved us by grace. They had some kind of idea. And Jesus says the same thing will happen. The time will come that anybody who kills you will think that he's doing God's service. How can you kill somebody and think that you are doing God's service? Because you think that this is the way God is. You think that God kills those who disagree with him. You think that God is intolerant and murderous and that God doesn't love those who disagree with him. And so you develop that attitude and you take it upon yourself to block, exterminate, persecute, blacklist, whatever it takes. To get rid of people who don't agree with you. And Jesus says. They will do these things. Because they have not known the father. And they have not known me. They have not known the father or me. This is the real problem brothers and sisters. So. What is, in is interesting. Is that when you look at. The way Jesus worked. It's very interesting. That when you look at Matthew chapter 13. And verse 34. We looked at this not so long ago, but I'm doing this by way of reminder. It says that in, in teaching people, it says, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. Jesus taught nothing according to what we see here in the book of Matthew. Jesus did not teach at all unless he used a parable. It says he did not speak unto them. Without a parable. So that's interesting. So it means that Jesus' teachings were not superficial. They were not on the surface. They were, they, were, they were hidden and they were deep. And he deliberately chose to use parables. I'm going to show you a, a, a few examples in just a moment. But it says that, it says a, a little further on in Matthew 13. We just read verse 34. Now in verses 10 to 13. It says, and the disciples came unto him, and, and, and the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. 
All right, that's great for me because I know I'm going to get more because I have. All right, I'm not shy to say this. I know God has given me some understanding and that is my assurance that I'm going to get more because Jesus says, whosoever hath to him shall be given. And what this is saying is that what do you have? You have Christ and you have God. You have Christ and you have God. You have found the Father and you have found the, the Son and therefore you have what it takes to know more and more because they are the source of knowledge. Because when you have come to know the Father and the Son, you have found eternal life and this eternal life opens the way. This eternal life is along with it comes the understanding of the kind of person God is. And so you will obtain more and more because the path of the just opens up more and more to the, to, to, to the perfect day. Everything becomes transparent when you come to know the character of God because this is a foundational issue in the universe. But Jesus said in verse 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. So, what he's saying is that the te my teachings, and I want to say the teachings of the Bible, because the Bible was designed by, by God and by Jesus. The teachings of the Bible are presented in such a way that for the people with the superficial minds, the people who don't know God, it will lead to greater and greater confusion. It is intended, according to Jesus, to create confusion among those who don't know him. I speak to them in parables because they see and they don't see and they hear, but they don't understand. And so I speak in parables that they might, they might not understand. And this is the way of the word of God. It leads the dark into greater darkness. And it leads those in light into greater light. Therefore, it becomes a dividing element to divide between sheep and goats. And so, this is why there is so much false doctrine. It's based on the Bible. But it's based on how you understand the Bible. Now, I'm just going to show you some, some examples of where Jesus made some crazy statements. But I'm saying this to show you how there's a lot of room for, for legalists to take hold of this. Let me show you. Let me just quote them quickly. Luke 6 and verse 60. Jesus says, you are not to ask for what is stolen. If somebody takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Jesus said that. Jesus said that Nathaniel would see angels of God ascending and descending upon Jesus. Have you ever seen angels walking up and down on Jesus? Did Nathaniel see that? He used a parable. Jesus said in Matthew 8, verse 21 to 22, Let the dead bury their dead. Are dead people to bury dead people? Parable. Par parable speaking. The legalist will take it literally. It's hard to take that one literally, but people will try. Trust me. In Luke 22, and verse 36, Jesus says, the person who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. I've heard people use this as justification for buying guns and for planning to kill people. So many things that Jesus says that people don't understand. And they don't even understand the method of how Jesus speaks. We have to understand the meaning behind the words. In Luke 16 and verse 8. It says the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. He tells them about a man who was a thief. And when his master decided to dismiss him, he did more stealing to back up himself. And Jesus commended this, 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 this thieving steward. Another parable. Do we understand it? In John 6 and verse 53, Jesus says, to the Jews that except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. In, in, in Matthew 18 and verse 18, Jesus says, if, if your hand or your foot offend you, cut them off and cast them from thee. I'm going a little fast here now because I'm aware that the time is almost gone. In Mark 7 and verse 27, Jesus says, Jesus called a woman a dog. He said it's not fit to take the children's bread and to cast it onto the dogs. He called a woman a dog. Did he mean it? 
words, but how do we understand them? In Matthew 19 and verse 17, Jesus says, if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Nobody can be saved by keeping, com keeping the commandments. Why did he say this? What did he mean? I'm just, I'm just reeling off these verses. I have a whole long list of them. In Mark 9 and verse 44, Jesus says that you could be cast into hell where the fire is never quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Is that to be taken literally? Is God going to roast people forever and worms eating them interminably, the God of love? In Luke 14 and verse 26, Jesus says, If you do not hate your father and your mother and your children and your brethren and your sisters and your own life, you cannot be his disciple. In John 4 verses 13 to 14, Jesus says that those who believe on him will have a well of water springing out of their belly. Over and over and over and over. In, in, in Matthew 16 and verse 23, he called Peter Satan. In Matthew 5 verses 39 to 42, he says, If a man strikes you on one side, you are to turn the other cheek to that person also. Is that what you are supposed to do? In John 14 and verse 9, he says to Philip, He who has seen me has seen the Father. And, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? He says, have I been so long with you and yet have you not known me? When Philip said, show us the Father. Is he saying that he is the Father? Jesus says that in John 8 and verse 41, 51. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And on and on. I mean, there are quite a number of these. In John 9 and verse 39, he says, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see, that they which see not might see. And that they which see might be made blind. He came to blind people and to open the eyes of people. Anyway, I'm going to stop here because my time is up. But I just read through this long list of things that Jesus says. Because look here, this is the way the Bible is written. Jesus and his Father are the ones who designed the scriptures. And the same way that Jesus spoke is the same way that the Bible is designed. And this is why this is why there are so many false doctrines. Because people grab the statements, but they don't understand the meaning. And they don't understand the meaning because, first of all, they are not familiar with the Bible. But secondly, and most important, they don't know the God of the Bible. And that is what I want to say to you today, brothers and sisters, as a kind of, as a kind of background to what I want to say in the next few weeks. 